I call to order the June 20th, 2023 regular meeting of the Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission. For the record, my name is Barbara Howard and I chair the commission. Just a reminder to please silence your cell phones and any other electronic devices and to speak clearly into the microphone whether you're speaking up at the dais or giving testimony today. Would the clerk please call the roll so that we may verify the presence of a quorum? Commissioner Bjornberg. Present. Booty. Present. Dreyer. Present. Chair Howard. Present. Mal Blum. Present. Nystrom. Present. Vice Chair Sambol is absent. Mastin. Present. Struthers is absent. Van Der Eyck. Here. There are eight members present. Let the record reflect we do have a quorum and that Commissioner Sandbolt and Struthers both provided proper notice that they have a conflict this afternoon so their absences are excused. Our first order of business is to adopt the agenda for this meeting. We will work from the agendas that are available over by the clerk. I'll go through the agenda and sort out which items will be withdrawn, which items will be continued to a future meeting, which items will be discussed, and which items will be put on a consent agenda to be approved as recommended by staff. Item number four, 2900 Hennepin Avenue, Ward 7, adjacent to Ward 10. This application is for a certificate of appropriateness. Item number four will be discussed. Item number five, 5005 Lindale Avenue South, Ward 11, adjacent to Ward 13. This application is for demolition of a historic resource. Item number five will be discussed. So the proposed agenda, the following two items will have staff presentation, public comment, and commission discussion and action. Item number four, 2900 Hennepin Avenue, Ward 7, adjacent to Ward 10. And item number five, 5005 Lindale Avenue South, Ward 11, adjacent to Ward 13. Commissioners, may I have a motion to approve the proposed agenda? Nystrom, so moves. Thank you, Commissioner Nystrom. Is there a second? Mastin seconds. Thank you, Commissioner Mastin. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Those aye. opposed say nay. Any abstentions? The agenda is approved. Our next order of business will be to approve the minutes from our June 6th, 2023 meeting. May I have a motion to approve those minutes? Nystrom, so moves. Thank you, Commissioner Nystrom. Is there a second? Mastin seconds. Thank you, Commissioner Mastin. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Any abstentions? Uh, Melblum abstains. Bjornberg abstains. Thank you, Commissioners Melblum and Bjornberg. The minutes are approved. Before I open the hearing to public comments, let me summarize the process for conducting public hearings. We will take each agenda item in order. Planning staff will present its report, and then commissioners may ask questions of staff. Then I will open the public hearing and we will hear from the applicant and commissioners may ask questions of the applicant. After that, we will invite public comment. If you wish to speak, we need you to do two things. Be sure to sign up on the sheet that's over by the clerk. If you haven't done this already, you can also do that afterwards. And when you come up to testify, be sure to state your name and address for the record. Please keep your comments specific to the application before us today. We may have a lot of people who wish to speak on an item and I will be limiting comments to two minutes each and ask that you focus on any new information that hasn't already been presented by previous speakers. If you have any materials to hand out, please give them to our committee clerk and they will be distributed to the commission and entered into the public record. Do not approach the commissioners on the dais. After the public comments are complete, I will close the public hearing and commissioners will deliberate and act on the applications before us. So let's get started. Our first item is item number four, 2900 Hennepin Avenue, Ward 7, adjacent to Ward 10. The application is for a certificate of appropriateness. The staff report is presented by Rob Skalecki. Thank you, Chair Howard, and good afternoon, Commissioners. My name is Rob Skalecki, Senior City Planner in the Historic Preservation Section of the Planning Department. Today, I'm presenting a Certificate of Appropriateness at the Uptown Theater located at 2900 Hennepin Avenue, and this is for signage and lighting. 
The subject property is the Uptown Theater. It's an individually designated Minneapolis landmark. The property was built in two phases to complete the building that's recognized today. The original building was completed as the Lagoon Theater in 1916. The building was completely remodeled in 1939 to its current Casota stone-clad modern appearance as designed by Liebenberg and Kaplan. The city of Minneapolis recognizes the exterior of the building as significant for architecture as an excellent example of streamlined modern. And as the first movie theater in the country to have a three-sided vertical tower sign. The Uptown Theater is a very rare example of a Minneapolis landmark that is designated in part for the architectural significance of its signage and sign structure. CPED staff acknowledges that the historic sign features and lighting have been altered since the building's remodel in 1939. A light box previously ran from the bottom of the three-sided tower sign to the top of the marquee structure on the front, which is the east elevation. The light box structure was covered with metal panels in 1989. The original tower sign beacon cap, which was historically fully illuminated, was also removed in 1989, and this received approval from the HPC at that time. Thus, the character of the front elevation lighting and signage has changed with the removal of these historic points of illumination that were originally extant in the light box and beacon tower cap structure. And those can be seen here on the right. Vertical letters on the tower sign were originally halo lit with illumination behind the letters using 50 watt incandescent bulbs. All of the subject 24 sign letters that spell out uptown four times, that's three times on the vertical tower sign and one on the horizontal marquee, originally included face illumination by individual 25 watt incandescent light bulbs. Corners of the tower sign uh, were planned to be illuminated by six watt chaser bulbs. So this totaled for the lighting schedule um, in 1939 included 765 incandescent light bulbs, totaling a little over 16,000 watts of illumination for the building. Permit and photo evidence suggest that the individual letters um, and the face lettering was changed to neon at some point between 1945 and 1963, but the neon illuminated letters have since become associated with the Uptown Theater's appearance, even though this was not a historic feature of the theater. In late September 2020, CPED noticed the historic tower sign letters had been removed without approval, and orders to correct were written by the zoning inspector requiring a preservation application to review the unpermitted work. So all three of the sides of the vertical tower, all the letters there, totaling 18 letters were removed without approval, and the six horizontal letters on the front, uh, which is the east face of the marquee, were the only original letters that were not removed and they remain. The applicant is proposing to replace each of the 24 historic steel letters that spell out uptown in four locations with aluminum letters. The 18 vertical letters on the tower sign structure have already been removed without approval. Six of these letters are shown to have been repaired and installed in the property's interior without application review or approval. Other vertical letters that were removed from the tower sign have not been repaired and are shown to be located in outdoor locations um, in an unknown area. It is not known how the damage depicted in the submitted photos was incurred. Aside from the 18 vertical sign letters, the remaining six horizontal uh, letters on the marquee wall sign still remain at the building um, and they are proposed for replacement. The proposed new sign letters were designed to match the dimensions and the placement of the historic letters. Uh, lighting changes for the applicant's proposal will include the replacement of all remaining incandescent lights and electrical socket components that are deteriorated beyond repair. Existing non-historic neon within the sign letter cavity will be removed and contemporary LED Auroraflex lights will be installed in place. The applicant is not proposing to return to the historic lighting schedule that would have included those individual bulbs within the letters. And the contemporary LED in place of the non-historic neon is planned to achieve a similar brightness and appearance to the traditional neon that existed on the property for many decades. 
With that, the Department of Community Planning and Economic Development has analyzed the application to allow for repairs and replacement of the sign and lighting features at the Uptown Theater based on the five applicable findings for a certificate of appropriateness. I will focus on the guidelines finding for this presentation. So CPED evaluated the proposed project under the relevant sections of the design guidelines, the neighborhood movie theater thematic district guidelines for rehabilitation, which were adopted in 1991, state the following. Under the guideline for exterior lighting and signage, um, As conditioned, the project will meet the exterior lighting and signage guidelines, provided that the letters will be repaired instead of replaced, since these are significant sign features that have um, already been shown to have been repaired uh, or repairable by the applicant. As previously noted, CPED is aware that the original illumination um, program of the tower sign marquee, light box, and tower beacon features have been altered throughout the theater's history. Staff also understands that incandescent light features are becoming more difficult to install new and maintain while LED products continue to be available to allow for a comparable glow, lumens, and color when compared to incandescent and neon fixtures. Additionally, the, um, the features like the light box and tower and, and sign beacon, um, the tower sign beacon have been removed and these historic features would have emitted a much greater amount of light at the building than the present conditions. The LED lights proposed for replacement for the incandescent bulbs and neon features um, and the property sign in the property signage are appropriate and have been designed in the spirit of the original lighting concept, which meets the guidelines. Section seven of the guidelines for removal of historic fabric state the following. Selective removal of original building materials is allowed when original materials have deteriorated beyond repair or as part of an adapted reuse, adaptive reuse for the building. HPC approval is required for removal of any historic building materials. Um, staff does note that the new sign letters uh, were designed to match the dimensions and the placement of the historic letters and the aluminum material proposed by the applicant would be contemporary and appropriate material to consider when replacing deteriorated historic sign letters. However, the applicant has not presented enough evidence to show that all of the letters can be replaced. Additionally, the letters are individually installed in the sign board. The appropriate consideration for replacement of deteriorated beyond repair letters would be to only replace the individual letters that cannot be repaired and not replace all 24. The applicant submitted photos suggest that all letters can be repaired with common metal patching and rust mitigation treatments. The applicant, submit, um, the, applicant submitted limit, lin, the applicant submitted limited evidence to show deterioration that would suggest that the letters cannot be repaired. While rust is present, welding repairs, patching, and or epoxy treatments can be used to repair deteriorated steel, and one set of letters, as previously noted, has already been repaired, repainted, and installed on the interior. It is unlikely that repaired, refinished, and repainted letters, which can be and are shown to have been repaired and refinished, would be unsuitable for reinstallation on the exterior where they were originally meant to exist historically. And with that, the Department of Community Planning and Economic Development recommends that the Heritage Preservation Commission adopt staff findings for the Certificate of Appropriateness by Rita Goodrich at the Uptown Theater, an individual historic landmark located at 2900 Hennepin Avenue and recommend the motion that the Heritage Preservation Commission approves the certificate of appropriateness to allow for repairs and replacement of the signs and lighting at the Uptown Theater located at 2900 Hennepin Avenue subject to the following conditions. One, that all 24 of the historic Uptown sign letters shall be retained, repaired, and reinstalled at the exterior of the building in their original location, placement, and configuration. Two, that the proposed LED lighting features shall be installed in the repaired historic sign letters and three, that new LED lights must be consistent with zoning specifications for lighting, and that historic drawings and photo evidence shall be used to ensure bulb brightness and glow will emit similar appearance to the original incandescent bulbs. The remaining conditions of approval, numbers four and five, are standard conditions of approval for a certificate of appropriateness. Um, and with that, I am available as staff for questions, but I do believe the applicant is here and will speak as well. Thank you. Thank you for the report. Commissioners, are there questions for staff? I'm not seeing anything currently. Thank you, Mr. Skalecki. 
I will now open the public hearing for this item, and I understand the applicant is here and would like to speak. Per usual, name and address for the record. My name is Rita Goodrich. I'm with McDonald and Mac Architects, um, 1305 Cleveland Avenue, St. Paul. Um, can I pop this in? I'll just go through these really quickly because you have the application and, you, and you've seen what Rob presented, so obviously the sign without. Um, but I think some information that I could provide that I think would be helpful um, is um, three things, I guess. One is that the intention was, from what I understand from the owner, I'm not the architect of the project, I'm the, um, I'm the representative for the HPC application. Um, but from what I understand, the painters went up there to paint the sign. And the lighting people went up there <laughs> to look at what was going on. A number of the um, neon lights were already out. And um, so what, it, what was determined is there was a lot of um, A little hard to see from this, but the back, the, a lot of the background was very peeled paint, and the, they didn't feel like the letters were um, substantially attached to leave them there and paint and do a suitable painting job, and then to be able to do the, um, the lighting with the letters and stuff. So at that point, um, the letters were taken down. Um, there have been past repairs on the letters. Um, I was able to observe of the large letters on the tower sign, um, and I will say the tower, the tower is remaining. Nothing has changed or is changing on that, and that the sign, the letters are an element of the sign. Um, the, um, the light bulbs will be put back, the um, ladders are still there, the background's been painted or will be painted. And so really my, the focus of what I'm talking about is the letters. Um, the, and I should back up and say that the owner is um, willing to accept the conditions except for reusing the existing letters, which um, we uh, are suggesting are not, are not um, repairable and being able to use it again. So this, this is an example of one of the letters that's been repaired in the past. I, I do acknowledge there are other ways to repair these, but they, there, there has been a lot of work done to these. They're 84 years old, they're steel, and there's a surface on every letter that is flat or rounded that holds water, and that's where the rust is. Um, I know that... Um, Rob mentioned the letters that had been repaired inside. Um, the repair that was done on those, and this is one of these letters up close, had none of the paint removed. It was just painted over. Um, and I can show you a close up. This is an area of repair, um, kind of in that smoother section on the letters inside. Um, let's see, and here's another one. You can see kind of a mesh that's put on there, and then here's another. What the repair of these letters that were hung up inside is, um, <coughs> is just fiberglass tape with Bondo over, which would not be a suitable repair for an exterior. Um, if these letters I would, um, I mean, the applicant here, but if, um, if I were consulting on the repair of these, I would suggest that the paint would all have to be removed because there is so much rust underneath. And um, one thing that I noticed when I was there looking at 
the letters. So this one is the bottom of a letter. That's where a lot of the damage is because the water just drains and sits and then it rusts out. But there's one hole here, but if you remove this paint, the amount of rusting and thinning of that metal, this, this would not be a hole to patch. This would be the whole bottom because it's just thin. What I did not do with the letters when I went there to take pictures is like to ping them with a hammer or to you know take a caliper and measure them. But they're quite thin, and, and the metal is flaking and rusting. So, so um, I guess that what I would say is I respectfully disagree in that the, these are repairable. Um, they are at a height. Um, and a distance and that will not, that the change in metal will not be perceivable. It's something that will last and um, the, the sign company that's proposing to make the letters has been very careful to um, complete shop drawings that show that they are recreating exactly what was there. Um, and I guess one of the biggest issues is the safety of it. Um, they had thought they could reuse the brackets that hold them. It's been determined they don't feel like that is safe, that they, that, um, they just aren't comfortable putting these letters back up. Um, and I think any repairs would be so close to rebuilding, rebuilding them. Um, that's really high and we can't have anything um, coming off. Um, the other comment I wanted to make is I was able to observe um, the letters are still on the marquee and there are letters, um, I observed two sets of letters, the third set of Uptown is not accessible. It's, it, it doesn't exist. So we can't put letters up that they no longer have. Those I think were determined to be in such poor shape that unfortunately when they were taken down, um, they were disposed of from what I understand. Um, so this is where we're at. <laughs> we are trying to get the, the letters back up on the sign and um, I think there was um, due diligence done to look at the condition of the letters and um, the, What's being proposed, as Rob did acknowledge, does match what's there in terms of the placement. They have, the, they have some of the letters. And um, I guess I'm um, available for questions if you have any. Thank you for the, the comments. I, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, these were taken down in September. They've been sitting outside for the last however many months unprotected? Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, the letters that I saw when I did this application um, were, there was one set in a garage that I went to Plymouth okay. and saw, and then those letters were taken out of a garage so I could photograph them. Okay. And then there, um, that, that was the painter, and then he had taken the letters to paint that went up in the theater, and they're, they're at the theater. And, so. and when were those installed in the, inside the theater? That I cannot tell you, but I, but I would suggest that if there's, I don't think that from last fall there's been such damage to them that wasn't already there that would prevent them from being used, or from being repaired. I'm just concerned that they were taken down and not pr protected. Oh. If he had any intention of putting, putting them back up, I would have thought that they would have been protected while they were down. Well, from what I could tell, the, the two sets were. The third set, I cannot tell you what happened to so them we have, other than I've we have been told two. they're not available. We have, What's two, that? we have two of the three sets then that would be subject to this condition. Correct. Yeah, I, okay. I can't fabricate the other ones that right. are, are not there. I have been okay. told they're not available, so that's as much as okay. I can answer. Thank you. Uh, any other questions uh, for the applicant? 
I'm not seeing any, thank you. Are there any members of the public who wish to speak for or against this application? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Commissioners, let's discuss. And I, I feel the same way that I did toward the music box. We don't have the evidence before us, so I don't know how we can approve it as written. Um, we need to have evidence that they have deteriorated beyond repair before they can be replaced in kind. And what really frustrates me is that this is the second time that something has happened at this building that happened before getting a permit and before getting a certificate of appropriateness from us. And that's really frustrating. But, but in the end, I'm looking at it very similar to the, the music box theater that we just looked at where we didn't have the evidence of the, the metal um, being deteriorated. So I'm curious to see how other people feel. Commissioner Bjornberg. Yeah, I will echo that completely and, and say, like, I am not seeing something um, that says to me that this is beyond repair. Um, I will also say that seeing some of the letters um, repaired and put up inside is, is also really contradictory then because it feels like, well, we could repair them, but only for this use. And um, so I, I would look for a lot more evidence. So I, I really appreciate the um, conditions that staff wrote. Thank you. Other comments, thoughts, motion? Commissioner Nystrom. I mean, I feel <clears throat> the same way as the two of you, um, that I also agree with how staff wrote these conditions. Um, do we need to make an amendment because we're missing a set of letters? <laughs> Is my question, I guess, for staff? Or do we can, can we approve it as written even though there's a set missing? Is my question, I guess. I don't know if we can answer that. That's a good question. I would look to staff. Do we need to change the numbers? Because obviously if a set is missing, um, it would have to be reconstructed, restored, whatever the proper, proper term is. Yeah. Thank you, Chair Howard. Andrea Burke, um, Supervisor for the Historic Preservation Team in CPED. I'm going to state facts here as I know them. Um, Staff was told that the other letters were missing too, and then we received evidence that they existed. I do not know, you know, I'm going to believe our applicant in saying that they're missing. Um, and with that, I, I know I find it hard to, I'm not entirely sure what to do with the condition since it seems to be that we, the, the status of those letters is unknown, whether they exist or not. Um, once again, just, Stating, stating information as we received it previously. Um, I'm going to actually turn to staff, um, Rob Skalecki, for this since I, he is most familiar with the project um, and has looked at it in depth uh, since, I don't know at this point. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Chair Howard. And as Andrea mentioned, um, we were under the impression that the letters still existed, we didn't have a reason to believe otherwise. Um, so that's why we made this condition. Um, I do believe if the applicant would want to propose, um, you know, a new scope of work that included repair and, um, you know, fabrication of the new letters, given that we have new information now, um, they could come back to the HPC with another application they would like. Uh, but the, the commissioners are also welcome to make your own conditions based on this new information. Uh, thank you, Mr. Skalecki, and thank you, Andrea. Um, I would, I would um, tend to think we should leave the motion written as is then, if there's any chance for those letters to still be in existence. Yeah. That would just be my opinion, but I don't know how other commissioners feel. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have anything uh, ex exceptional to add other than just to say, and I know um, our applicant is probably um, put in a not awesome situation given that this isn't your project, you didn't remove the letters, um, but I do 
uh, hope that you can bring the message back to the owner of the building that this is extremely frustrating to, to see this happen, to see this removed. This is obviously a landmark. The process for this stuff, like is, we've had applicants, particularly on single family homes, not be aware of, of the process. And I think that's totally understandable, but this is a, a um, gentleman who's done other major historic projects um, and he should know better. Um, and in fact, I think he does. So I just want to underscore that I'm hopeful that you can bring that message back to him. Um, that this is frustrating. I think it's frustrating for us commissioners. Well stated. Commissioner Melba. It also appeared to me that if you looked at the, if you look at the drawing of the kind of the typical letter T that they have on page 58 of their application, it doesn't look like it's that the metal would be formed in the same way um, that what we showed where it looked like you had, where the two pieces met, there was kind of a, a big corner seam. And so I recognize that the intent of replacing something is not to replace it, to mimic exactly what was there, but that seems like it's a, that kind of that chunkiness of the way that the letters were originally built is an important distinctive part. So for me, I, that's one of the stronger, re at least for me personally, that seems one of the strongest reasons to not accept these letters being um, supplied to replace the existing letters. Thank you, Commissioner Blumblum. And um, when it comes to replacement of deteriorated historic fabric, you are supposed to replace in kind, if at all possible, and that includes that chunkiness mm -hmm. that you talk about. So. Um, it's a little different when you're uh, putting in something new to replace something that you don't have any evidence of or something like that. When you're replacing in kind, using the, the infamous Secretary of Interior standards phrase, um, we expect it to look the same. Yeah, thank you. Commissioner Nystrom. I would like to make a motion. Um, that the Historic Preservation Commission approves the certificate of appropriateness um, to allow repairs and replacements of the signs as conditioned by staff, um, but that includes condition one, all 24, or however many there are, um, all 24, preferably, <laughs> of the uptown sign letters shall be retained, repaired, and reinstalled at the exterior. The proposed LED lighting features shall be installed and repaired, um, and the repaired historic sign letters. And, um, condition three, the new LED lights must be consistent with zoning specifications for lighting, historic drawing, and photo evidence shall be used to ensure brightness, and gl glow will admit similar appearance to original incandescent bulbs, including the two standard conditions as well. Thank you, Commissioner Nystrom. Just for clarification, you're recommending um, approval with the conditions as, as written. written by staff, yes. That's okay. Do I have a second to that? Bjornberg seconds. Thank you, Commissioner Bjornberg. Any further discussion? Seeing none, would the clerk please call the roll? Commissioner Bjornberg. Aye. Booty. Aye. Chair Howard. Aye. Dreyer. Aye. Mastin. Aye. Melblum. Aye. Nystrom. Aye. Vanderike. Aye. There are eight ayes. Thank you, that motion passes. Our second item is item number five, 5005, Lindell Avenue South, Ward 11, adjacent to Ward 13. This application is for a demolition of a historic resource. The staff report is presented by Aaron Kay and uh, Ms. Burke. Yeah, I have a, a statement. I'm going to recuse myself from this item. Um, Kimberly Holine, the manager of the Land Use Design and Preservation Group, will sit in my place. I believe she's still on her way here. So in that, I'm going to ask Rob Skalecki, his staff, to sit in my place until she arrives. That, that makes sense. Thank you. Go ahead. 
Good afternoon, Chair Howard, Commissioners. My name is Erin Kay, and I am a city planner in the Historic Preservation Section of the Department of Community Planning and Economic Development, or CPED. I am here today to present a demolition of historic resource application for the property located at 5005 Lindell Avenue South, which falls within the boundary of the potential Washburn Park Residential Historic District. Staff received two written comments prior to the publishing of the staff report last week, which were in your packet. And we received additional comments that were shared with you before the start of the hearing. The property is located at the southeast corner of the intersection of 50th Street West and Lindale Avenue South, outlined in teal on this aerial photo. Last month, the applicant requested a historic review letter from CPED. CPED staff determined that the subject property is a potential historic resource for its association with the potential Washburn Park Residential Historic District. And here is a map of the potential Washburn Park Residential Historic District with the subject property identified by a blue star. This potential historic district has been studied at various points over the last four decades. A draft nomination to list the potential district in the National Register of Historic Places was prepared in 1981. However, the potential district has not been formally listed in the National Register. The Minnesota State Historic Preservation Office, or SHPO, has determined the district, the potential district, to be eligible for listing in the National Register. This area was platted in 1886 and planned as a garden suburb by a group of prominent businessmen. Renowned landscape architect Hor Horace W.S. Cleveland designed the layout of the neighborhood with curvilinear streets and relatively large lots, taking into account its location near Minnehaha Creek and the hilly topography, which you can see here in this map. In 2005, as part of the Southwest Minneapolis Historic Resources Inventory for the city, the consultants also recommended the potential district for potential local landmark designation under Criterion 5 as a significant landscape design and or pattern of development. Local landmark designation of this potential district has not been pursued. And here are some photos of the subject property. This is the west elevation facing Lindale Avenue South. This is the south elevation, the north elevation, the east elevation, and the garage. The applicant is proposing demolition of the property here at 5005 Lindale Avenue South, which consists of a house and a garage, as shown in the photos. The applicant is planning to build a four-story residential building. The proposed development will be reviewed by the Planning Commission at a later date and is not part of this application. The existing house was built in 1912, and the existing garage was built in 1917. According to records at SHPO, the period of significance for the National Register eligible district is 1886 to 1959, and the subject property is considered a contributing resource. For this application, staff analyzed the significance and integrity of the subject property and the potential historic district. A detailed history was presented in the staff report and attached historic review letter. Staff finds that the subject property does not have individual historical significance under any of the seven criteria for local designation. The subject property has experienced some changes, including the conversion of the front porch into a furnished room, replacement windows and doors, and the small rear addition. Overall, staff finds that the subject property retains good integrity. In staff's analysis of the potential district, the potential Washburn Park Residential Historic District appears to have historical significance under Criterion 3 for neighborhood identity, Criterion 4 for architecture, and Criterion 5 for landscape design. The curvilinear streets, and streets that are generally not more than one to two blocks long, contribute to the area's nickname and now preferred name, Tangletown. This street layout, responsiveness to natural features, and landscape design is also distinctive when compared to the traditional orthogonal street grid found throughout Minneapolis. Most of the properties in the potential district were built in the 1900s through 1930s and exhibit characteristics of period revival styles that were popular of that time, and also Victorian stick and shingle styles. Uh, Gemini Research, one of the historical consultants who reviewed this in the past, suggested that this is an excellent concentration of some of the city's best period revival designs. Although individual properties have experienced change over time, staff finds that the potential district 
retains sufficient integrity to convey its historical significance under criteria three, four, and five. For the destruction of a historic resource, one of two findings must be met. Under the first finding, CPED finds that the demolition is not necessary to correct an unsafe or dangerous condition. Under the second finding, CPED finds that there are no reasonable alternatives to demolition. The subject property at 5005 Lindell Avenue South is not individually listed in or eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. The subject property does not appear to be eligible for designation as an individual landmark. As I've mentioned, the subject property is located within the potential Washburn Park Residential Historic District, which does have historical significance under criteria three, four, and five, and retains integrity. Based on its build year of 1912, the subject property is a contributing resource to this historic district. However, it is not exemplary of the potential district's historical significance. It is located on the western edge of the potential district boundary and located in a section of traditionally gridded streets, not along the curvilinear streets for which the area is known. The section also appears to have been subdivided in order to increase density in the neighborhood in the early 1900s, when the initial experiment of the garden suburb with large lots was not as successful as the planners had hoped. It does not exhibit known characteristics of any architectural style, including the period revival styles for which the potential district is known. Therefore, CPED finds that the demolition of the subject property will not significantly impact the historical significance or integrity of the potential Washburn Park Residential Historic District. CPED recommends that the Heritage Preservation Commission adopt staff findings and approve the demolition of historic resource application for the property located at 5005 Lindale Avenue South. This concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer questions, and the applicant is also available to take questions. Thank you for that report. Um, I have one question for you, um, and that has to do with, well, I guess it's two. I, do you agree with the, the boundary and the period of significance that for the district as shown in the, the documentation that you've reviewed? I had, I had questions about whether or not the, the orthogonal portion in that corner, that side, really fits as part of the Tangletown period of, uh, of development and I'm, I, without the, the full documentation, I'm just curious if you would agree with that. And does that National Register evaluation uh, carry over to what we would see for local designation if it were done? Thank you, Chair Howard. Uh, staff did not have a discussion about the boundary and the significance. I can offer my personal opinion based on uh, my review of the information. Um, I think in the historical record, there is some I don't want to say disagreement, but maybe there, there are diff different areas that could be considered part of um, the potential district. So that, that boundary as, and I can pull it up for reference. Um, that boundary chose to use 35W on the east end as the east boundary, um, but in the historical record, it seems that the neighborhood probably extended further east. Um, there are also some mentions of the boundary originally potentially going to 54th Street, and I don't know if that refers to how far the southern edge dips, and maybe that's in alignment with 54th Street, or if potentially in the late 1800s, they may have considered any properties on the south side of the creek to be part of that neighborhood. Um, in terms of the period of significance, that was found on a pencil handwritten note on this inventory from 2009, which we believe is related to um, a Section 106 project for sound insulation along 35W. And I know, especially given your experience, that Chippo pencil comments um, are often coming from staff. We don't know that for sure, but I think the 1959 N mark also is probably responsive to the 50 year National Register rule um, since it was done in 2009 and may not actually reflect uh, a period of significance or, or other information could come to light that refines what that end point should be. That's very helpful, thank you. Are there other questions from commissioners for staff? Go ahead. Um, can you just clarify for me, if this did become an officially recognized district, do you believe this property would be contributing? 
Thank you, Chair Howard, uh, Commissioner Mastin. To determine whether or not this property itself could be contributing would depend on the period of significance and potentially also the reasons for significance. Commissioner Nystrom. Um, <clears throat> in your research for this, do you, did you see how many demolitions have come to the HBC for this potential district? Like, were there, have there been others that have come to HBC in this potential district before this property? Do you know? Thank you, Chair Howard and Commissioner Nystrom. Uh, my understanding is this is the first demolition of historic resource application to come, for, come before the HPC related to this potential district. Okay, and then my follow-up question is, in this district, and I don't know that this is really relevant, but like, do you know of any other large multifamily housing projects in this district or no? Um, I am oh, not okay. familiar with them. I know that the applicant did provide some information in their application okay. regarding some um, potential precedents within the vicinity. I'll take a peek at that again. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Meldum. Yeah, Ms. Kay, I have a couple of questions. Um, first is, your review is made irrespective of what is planned to be on that site, correct? Thank you, Chair Howard, Commissioner Belden. Yes, this, the focus of this application and our review is solely about the demolition of the property at 5005 Lindale. So the fact that the applicant wants to put a multifamily building there has no relevance to your review, correct? Correct, the proposed development is not subject to the preservation review. Okay, thank you. And then a follow-up question. Um, the fact that this is a potential district and not a real historic district, what relevance does that have to your review or the feasibility of this house being having some historic relevance as part of a district? Thank you, uh, Chair Howard, Commissioner Melbum. I'm, I will answer part of that, and then you'll have to let me know if I didn't quite answer your question. Um, so we have several preservation applications that we use depending on the situation. Um, so the demolition of historic resource application is the one used in the situation that it's a potential historic district or landmark or resource, um, but it's not an officially designated landmark or district. Whereas if this were an established historic district, it would be a certificate of appropriateness application that would then address very similar findings of destru destruction. And as a last question, if this was a designated district, do you have any sense that you would have come to a different conclusion? I think to answer that question, we would then need to know the areas of significance, so we would need confirmation of which criteria for which this right. hypothetical historic district was designated, um, the period of significance as we've been talking about how the subject property fits into that. And so I think it'd be difficult to conjecture at this point what the conclusion would be. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? Thank you very much. I will now open the public hearing for this item. I understand the applicant is here and would like to speak. Be sure to state your name and address for the record. Sure. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Todd Smith, and I live at 20 East Elmwood Place uh, in, in Tangletown. Um, thank you all for volunteering your time and skills to the Heritage Preservation Commission. Uh, also, thanks, Aaron, and the rest of the Historic Review staff uh, in the planning department. Uh, I'm a principal in a real estate development company here in Minneapolis called Master Properties, and we specialize in urban infill projects. Um, to the Historical Review staff, uh, thank you for recommending approval of application for demolition. Although not part of the review, um, just a little background. This site is built from Corridor 4 and zoned Urban Neighborhood 3. The proposed development is a conforming project. A couple quick thoughts from my perspective as the applicant. 
Aaron, can you help me do something? Can I have page three of your presentation? Uh, yeah, that's good. That'll be fine. Thank you. Um, so as noted in my application and in the staff report, the structure has no significance or high integrity. Only the potential district itself is significant, not the house. The idea of a potential district is a tough concept to wrap your head around. Um, it either is a district or it is not a district and having to be examined at a higher standard of a potential district that is not codified seems unfair. Second, um, can I get to... It's not going any further. Oh, in your whole packet, I would like exhibit A. Shoot, okay. Um, I made a different map that I think is in the staff findings, and it was looked like this. And I took borders that I found that were different and larger that you were just discussing. Whether it goes to 54th Street, does it go east to 35? This map shows things that are in and adjacent to the district uh, that have been built uh, since 1981. And the last three uh, are multifamily um, that have been built since 2005. But regardless of that, even if there were a Washburn Park Residential Historic District, the subject site wouldn't be in it. Criterion five would be the triggering criterion and the property doesn't exemplify a landscape design or development pattern distinguished by innovation, rarity, uniqueness, or quality of design or detail. If you look at the map that's up here, where the streets are curvy, and when you look at different topo maps where you can see uh, the changes in elevation and the tree canopy, that's really where the district is. And in the subject site is flat, not a typical city street grid. So even if it were to become a district, I don't think this would be part of it. And we can't know because it's a potential and it hasn't been studied. Um, so I was going to show something else. It was just an elevation. But uh, what we hope to build is a 20-unit multifamily apartment building with a mix of one, two, and three bedrooms, uh, predominantly two bedrooms. There will be 34 underground parking stools. Uh, and uh, the, plans, the project supports six of the 13 goals that are the foundation for the city's uh, 2040 comprehensive plan. Do any of you have any questions for me? Thank you for those comments, commissioners. Any questions for the applicant? Thank you for the consideration. I'm not seeing any. I just wanted to mention that Rob Skalecki has, set, has stepped down <laughs> and Kimberly has arrived. Yes, sorry to throw you for a loop. This is where I sit for planning commission and you guys do a different arrangement for HPC. So we do. I'm over here. I saw you sneak in, that's all right. All right, um, are there any members of the public who wish to speak for or against this application? Be sure to state your name and address for the record. We are keeping it to two minutes and keep in mind this is for the demolition of the, the resource, not for the new <clears throat> development. Yep, uh, I will keep the mind. Good afternoon, Chair Howard and uh, Commission members. Um, <clears throat> my name is Jim Harwood. Uh, I own and live at the home at 5009 Lindell Avenue South and previously owned and lived at the home at 5125 Lindell Avenue South. So that's two different ownerships in this district that I've lived in over the past several years. And I'm going to provide a little bit about the development only as context for my specific request related to the, what's in front of you. Um, over the past several weeks, I've heard from many neighbors in Tangleton residents about their concerns of the, of the project. You know, there are very valid concerns that will be he heard through a planning commission process on, on traffic, parking, pedestrian safety, et cetera. But the one Comment I have heard resoundingly over and over from most people is that this proposed development just doesn't fit and it will dramatically change the character of the neighborhood. And I'll come back to, to the request here. So in reading the staff report, I may not agree with the staff report finding that the demolition of the subject property will not significantly impact the historical significance or integrity of the potential district. However, 
Uh, but I understand it, I should say. I can understand the finding. I can understand what uh, Mr. Smith uh, said as well as it relates to that individual building. However, that proposed development uh, with its requested 27-foot front yard setback variance will have a, a huge negative impact on the integrity of location, setting, feeling, and association of the potential Washburn Park Residential Historic District. So as stated in the staff report, this district was recommended a potential district for designation in 2005, uh, though it wasn't pursued. There's no information on why it wasn't pursued or why it wasn't, but it wasn't. And since that time, I think, is... Uh, Ms. Kay brought up, there haven't been any sites demo in that district that have come before this commission for demolition. I believe Exhibit A shows three properties that are just outside of the, uh, what's located here on this exhibit. So today, um, I'm requesting that the commission deny demolition only to direct staff to commence a designation study to determine if this should be uh, an actual, you know, designated an actual historic district. Again, whoop, that's two minutes. That's two minutes. It goes okay. by fast. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you for those comments. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Maybe, maybe not. No? Okay. We do have all of the emails as well, so if you're trying to think you should come up and just read your email, we've got those. We've read them. All right. Last call. Any other public Speakers, seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Commissioners, let's discuss this one. Commissioner Nystrom. This one's tough because we can really only comment on the demolition and because it's not a district, like it's hard for me to really feel like yes, but also it's 600 some properties. So like having to then start a like Asked to do a designation study is a lot, so like, I I'm having a hard time with this because, yeah, I don't know. I under I, I understand staff's findings, but I also have a hard time like, yeah, demo, demoing any property that's anywhere near a historic district or hit, like has history of any kind is hard like, t for me to process. I don't know about anybody else, but those are my thoughts, and I'm just having a tough time with this. I don't know if anyone else has any more clear direction on how they're feeling other than me just rambling. I understand those feelings entirely. Uh, Commissioner Melblum. Thank you, Chair Howard. Um, so I think it's important for us to not get caught up on what's going to be built there, but because that's not part of our purview, we're only being asked to comment on the relative merits of demolishing or not demolishing this house. And I think the the staff report makes a, a very credible case for the fact that this house doesn't deserve um, historic protection. The thing that does disturb me, and it's come up now several times with several people kind of relating to it, is the fact that this is a potential district. And I feel like there's a cruelty on the part of the city for having this cloud hanging over this because I think for people who live in the district they feel that there probably is some sense of historic integrity that's not been proved and therefore they potentially are thinking they can hang their hat on that as a reason to stop something yet the reality is that that hasn't been granted and therefore it's cruelty is partially that then somebody comes to do a project that by all accounts would match the intents of the 2040 plan and zoning and I recognize that there's a variance being asked for but that's not our purview to comment upon but otherwise they're being asked to to have to go through this review process for something that in, in essence is kind of a nebulous review because it doesn't really exist. So I know we can't ask the staff to do something about that, but I think as a commission, this should be something that we discuss further and find out if there are other potential districts and why aren't these, why, why isn't something being adjudicated about them? Either they do the study and decide it's relevant or not. The fact that this thing has been looked at more than once and 
in 2005, nothing was done out of it, and that's what 18 years later. I, I just frankly don't think that it should be relevant. It is relevant because of the the odd rules that we have to work under. I don't think it should be relevant because it's not been proven that this is a historic district. Thank you, Commissioner Meldlam. I think that although we don't typically direct staff, I think that for our next staff retreat, we can ask for additional discussion of a topic like this, our next commission retreat, I should say. We can have additional discussion of something like this, and so I'd put that in the back of your mind for sure um, for an agenda item, and I'll use this as a heads up to staff now. Um, I think it is important for us to understand how many potential districts are out there. Um, when it comes to things that come in through Section 106 reviews, that's a, um, you know, I don't even know if staff even sees all of them because <laughs> the city isn't always invited to be a consulting party on Section 106 reviews, but um, we could at least find out more about what we do know about at the city and, and, and have some discussion around that. So thank you for bringing that up. Commissioner Booty. I don't have much, oh, thank you, Chair Howard. Um, I don't have much to add that, other than what's been said so far, um, as just to kind of throw out the information that I believe if we were to deny this application, we would be, um, we would have to find, or we would have to be in agreement, I believe, with whether the destruction of this property uh, violates the potential integrity of the district. And I just kind of wanted to state that, and that I personally, side with the, um, the staff findings that I don't necessarily agree that this individual property has um, the um, impact for the entire historic district. So it, it potentially could be a historic district still uh, with or without this property. I believe that's the case. Um, Kimberly, if, if we were to uh, go against staff findings and, and um, ask for a designation study, we'd be looking at a designation study for the entire district in most cases. That's correct, yep. So that would be the outcome of that is staff would prepare a designation study or um, study the entire district over the next year and report back to the commission with a recommendation on the district itself. Other thoughts, commissioners? I'm, I'm struggling with this one as well. I, I do feel your, your pain. Um, I, I question, I asked Aaron about, Aaron K, Ms. K, <laughs> about the, the boundaries and the period of significance because I question the boundaries as they're drawn here, just my knowledge of, of the district um, and the, the period of significance, we would be looking specifically at that, uh, the changes that have occurred to that house, even if it were a nine, you know, was originally built in the 19 teens um, there have been major changes and I would be looking to see are those changes within that period of significance so that's why I was I'm, I'm having the same questions Commissioner Dreher I think it's interesting to note that it appears this is actually this district has actually come up several times as a possible potential historic district but no one has ever pursued it, so I don't, even if another designation study were to be done, it's not clear that that would necessarily lead to action. Right. Typically our designation studies, when they're done through a process like this, they do result in one decision or another. But I don't think we've gotten that far on some of these other projects. Thank you, Commissioner Dreyer. Any further discussion, or would someone like to make a motion? Commissioner Melplum. I make a motion that we accept the staff recommendations as proposed by staff. Thank you, Commissioner Melplum. Is there a second? And actually, I'm, I think we need to make sure that you say that you the full finding that we oh, approve okay. the I, I recommend Sorry. that we accept the staff's recommended motion. The Heritage Preservation Commission approves the demolition of historic resources application for the property located at 5005 Lindale Avenue South. Thank you, Commissioner Melblum. Is there a second? 
Dreyer seconds. Thank you, Commissioner Dreyer. Any further discussion? Seeing none, would the clerk please call the roll? Commissioner Bjornberg. Aye. Booty. Aye. Chair Howard. Aye. Dreyer. Aye. Aston. Aye. Malblom. Aye. Nystrom. Aye. Vanderike. Aye. There are eight ayes. Thank you. That motion passes. And I'd encourage the community members who are here to continue watching the other avenues that you can have your voices heard. We're limited in what we can do at this commission, and there are other, other things to be said, <laughs> and we know there are. Thank you for taking your time to come to the meeting tonight, though. That concludes our public hearing items. Uh, commission and staff, are there any announcements or commission business to discuss? We'll start with Andrea Burke. Thank you. And thank you, Kimberly. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you to Kimberly as well for sitting in on that um, item. I do have a few updates um, for this evening. I wanted to note that our signage guidelines that were adopted at our last meeting um, were not appealed, so they are now active. And we are all very happy about it, so thank you. Um, we also have a step-up intern that will be joining um, our planning division starting next week. Um, her name is Yasmin, and you may or may not see her at, a, at an HPC meeting, but she will be joining for us for the summer to help out um, on some projects, and she will be working with both Aaron and Rob and some of the other staff at the planning division. Um, I also wanted to make a note that our Washburn Fair Oaks design guidelines, we will be receiving the final draft of that from the consultant today or tomorrow. And then shortly thereafter, ideally by the end of the week, if not early next week, we will be opening that up online for public comment for 30 days. This is all happening in advance before you, but for those that have participated and joined in some of the community engagement, this was a way to allow for more additional comment prior to it even become coming to you as a, a pre-step such as a discussion item. So I just wanted to make that note because that has been a large project over the last six or less months. Um, and then also, well, I'm gonna say the last one's premature. So I'm going to say that is the end of my updates. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Burke. Uh, any other announcements from commissioners? I just want to mention that the state tax credit legislation has passed. Uh, yay. Um, I know that this has come up in conversation. I've had some conversation via email with uh, Commissioner Melblum. I, I think that that may mean that we get more applications again. So um, maybe not as many canceled meetings, so just beware. Uh, if there are no other um, items, with that, we've completed all items on the agenda for this meeting. I will ask members and staff once more if there are any other matters to come before the commission. There being no other business to come before this meeting, and without objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. The next regular meeting of the Heritage Preservation Commission is July 11th, 2023. 2023. Enjoy the holiday on the 4th. would be so really trying to use the actual lab data now to help drive water quality to improve it for the people nitrite nitrate all clear all safe the taste and order work that we're doing has improved the taste of the water and it's been an initiative that uh, you know I'm happy to be a part of